Welcome to Okaloosa Today, local news and information. Connecting the communities of Hualda Beach, Destin, and Okaloosa County. Welcome to Okaloosa Today on Cox. This is your monthly look at the city of Destin, Fort Walton Beach, and Okaloosa County. I'm Doug Rayner, your host for the City of Destin segment of the show, which starts right now. And I have uh, a very seasoned guest and also a brand new guest, Steve Schmidt, uh, former community development uh, director, interim, I should say. He's our development manager and has been on the show many times. Thanks for being here today, Steve. Thanks for calling me seasoned. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. You, you certainly have been on this show plenty of times and, and, and have a really deep history of what's going on in the city and I think you'll enlighten us on a lot of good topics today. Also joining us is Miss Karen Haynes. She is our brand new community development director. Our first time on the show. Uh, I think you've been here with about two months now, maybe a about little. About two and a half months. Two and a half months. Um, you know I'm going to ask you, so, so <laughs> what do you think about it? Tell us a little I bit about yourself. I love Dustin. Um, yeah. I spent many years vacationing in, on the Gulf Coast with my family growing up, so I'm so excited for the opportunity to serve the city of Dustin as the new community development director. Well, we're happy to have you here because, you know, it brings some new life into the city. Um, you are, you have a, a, a really a good background for this. I'll let you expand on that in a second, but uh, you kind of moved into a department that, that is, uh, you've been working through a lot of tough issues. You're thrown right into the fire. You didn't have really much of a honeymoon with this. Um, give us some uh, background of your, uh, your work history. Well, prior to relocating to Destin, I lived um, and actually grew up in southwest Missouri um, and the serving in the public sector there, uh, both for the city of Springfield, Missouri, and then later for Christian County, Missouri. Uh, my background includes uh, working in areas of planning, code enforcement, building inspections, and also economic development. Um, I went to Missouri State University. I have a Bachelor of Science in Construction Management a Bachelor of Science also in Drafting and Design, a Master's in Administrative Studies with emphasis in Planning and Environmental Management, and then also a Master's in Public Administration. Um, additionally, I have several professional credentials including Certified Floodplain Manager, uh, Certified Public Manager, a Credentialed New Urbanist Planner, and also as an ICC Residential Building Inspector. So. And that's that's really important to what we're doing and you know I don't even understand what most of that means but, <laughs> but I know that it's important and it's good that we're bringing in talent that's highly qualified. Like your, your experience in the public sector is already going to be a, a benefit to us so we're, we're excited to have you here and Thank welcome you. aboard. I'm very excited to be here and my family and I are excited to make Dustin our home and enjoy all of the outdoor amenities and great weather that Dustin has to offer. And uh, just very excited to be, be here and starting work. Well, good. And we're about to dive into some, some of your department news and updates and, and things that you've been working on or your department's been working on that you're now in the middle of. And I'll turn to Steve. Steve, you did a great job over the last, I don't know how long, six or eight months you served as the interim community development director really seeing some projects through and, and some some big ticket items that are going to make an impact I think currently and then moving down the road. Yeah I should probably apologize to Karen for her job would probably be easier if it wasn't for my interim uh, <laughs> I don't involvement. think she'd say that. <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk about some of those things and, and one of them is the CRS certification and that is something that's important to our residents but but it's we're going to really start talking about what it is exactly and, and I want you to explain that and what your department did so that our re residents benefit from it. Uh, it's a community rating system which is what CRS stands for and, and it's basically um, FEMA allows communities uh, to basically go in above and beyond the normal uh, process for, for uh, floodplain protection and, and information and that sort of thing and and by doing that you can get some discounts on your uh, federal flood insurance program for certain areas flood prone areas and stuff mm -hmm. so um, we're we've maintained a CRS rating of six for several years I'm happy to report that we did it again this year and um, and so we go the extra mile basically to try to save uh, the citizens money on their homeowners insurance. And Karen, you came from a place that I don't think really was involved in this rating system, correct? Correct. So tell us why this is really that important to our residents. Uh, again, um, 
with what Steve said, it's very important for a community to become involved, if they can, in this type of program to offer that premium discount on, on flood insurance. Uh, it takes a large commitment from the community, uh, support from city council through the adoption of the local mitigation strategy, and also dedication and contributions from multiple city departments. So it's really a collaborative effort to obtain uh, the type of rating that we did. And, and what you just said, lastly, is very important, the collaboration. I, how hard was this to do, Steve? I mean, I think it, it wasn't just to fill out a form and turn it into FEMA. You guys worked very hard to make this happen. Yeah, it was harder for me because <laughs> it was the first time I'd ever done it. But uh, and, and it wasn't as hard as what we did last year, every, every, uh, or what the department did last year. Every five years, they basically uh, have to go through a, a much more significant process. This was just an annual recertification, but it did, uh, it did take a couple months of gathering data and putting a lot of stuff together for a package that ended up being uh, probably almost between one and two inches thick mm -hmm. uh, to send off to, uh, to get our re recertification done. We sent out 999 letters to, uh, to, to uh, basically people that were in repetitive loss areas or you know, that lived in that repetitive, near repetitive loss properties. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you know, that causes a little confusion. You end up answering the phone a good bit, but, uh, uh, but basically it's those outreach programs that help us reach the, the, the discounts. And we provide a newsletter annually on this topic that's updated f with FEMA language and things of that nature. I know our, our website's heavy with the local mitigation strategy. It's bound with, with the county's process as well. Um, but, but again, your team did a, a really good job. I think maybe boiling it all down to the moral of the story for our public is that the staff worked really hard to provide a discount for flood insurance for certain people in the city. And I think in, in, uh, NFIP means something to you guys. It doesn't mean a lot to me. Explain what that is. Uh, NFIP is the National Flood Insurance Program. And those are the, those are the people in Destin who would benefit from what, what the staff has done. Yes. Yes. That's, That's correct. That is great. And good job. Kudos to your staff. Again, I know they worked really hard. And, and Karen, you got to walk in, I think, about the time Steve <laughs> got his certificate saying it was done. So I think I got that the first week. So yes, <laughs> uh, they did a great job in getting everything done. And uh, we look forward to uh, having our, our residents enjoy, enjoying that benefit this year. That's great. Kind of changing gears a little bit, there's over the years, you know, we always identify issues in, in the community, something that your department deals with on the, uh, on the ordinance side, on the uh, regulation side and enforcement side is parking issues in Destin. Of course, it's winter, it's not the summertime, it's died down some, but we know it will build back up soon. Um, our season seems to be longer. We seem to have more people coming here and parking in the Crystal Beach area, the Holiday Isle area seems to really, uh, it's, it's getting tied over there. And, and so there's some enforcement things that the community development department is doing to really try to enhance that. Let's, let's talk a little <coughs> bit first about some regulations that may be put in place to help with the amount of vehicles that can be in certain pieces of property. And Karen, I think that's in the short-term rental regulations that you're working on. Yes, and that's actually an ordinance that Steve's been working on, but during uh, last Monday's, or the November 21st meeting, the Community Development Department presented for first reading a proposed ordinance for 1618 LC, which means, amends the site development standards for single family residential um, uses south of US 98. So within that proposed ordinance, it includes several changes for development standards. Uh, two of which are required parking spaces and open space requirements. Um, the proposed ordinance includes increasing the number of required parking spaces to one parking space per bedroom, and then also increasing the amount of open space required for each uh, parcel's development from 25 to 35 percent, or 25 to 30 percent. And that's a really big deal because right now if you have a, bed, a home with multiple bedrooms, multiple families can can take that space and rent it for a week and bring multiple cars and sometimes at least currently and in the past some of those lots may not have but a couple of parking spaces I think the intent is to to really fo moving forward manage that process yeah the old code basically required only f up to you know four parking spaces and so we've seen a, an increase in the number of houses that are being built with you know eight 
bedrooms, eight mm -hmm. living spaces, and, and uh, four parking spaces typically isn't enough. So, you know, it was an effort to kind of address some of the changes in the marketplace that we were seeing. And, and I think it's important to balance property rights where you own a piece of property and you can develop that and, and put a home with many bedrooms on it. But in turn, there's some things that needs to happen for the city and for the neighborhood that might benefit uh, green space and as well as, uh, as parking. You know, and responsible development and consideration for your neighbors says mm -hmm. you're not going to park in their front yard. So. <laughs> Speaking of parking in front yards, maybe rights of ways, there are, there are some, some towing options maybe or at least some parking regulations signs that we're looking at putting in some loca key locations yeah and and that's another summer driven issue i mean we've had so many people parking in the right of way and on people's property and that sort of thing uh, trying to go to the beach um, and then uh, you know we've we've started to craft an ordinance that would allow us to put up no parking signs in, in areas where we're, we're getting some of the most complaints and even provide that you know for the for the egregious, uh, um, you know, opportunities, basically, we, we, we'll have to, we'll tow them away. We'll get, we have the, the right to, you know, tow them and, you know, it's a, unfortunate we don't want to do that, but, uh, but sometimes when, uh, you know, when folks are uh, parking where they're not supposed to be in the rights of way and causing, uh, you know, some of the, some of the existing owners some pain, then uh, you've got to do something to, to solve that pain for them. And this is that balancing act. Karen, I know this this weighs heavy on your department, your division, code enforcement. I mean, you know, our phone rings off the hook, especially in the summertime for, for issues usually due to the, the crowd that's here. And I know that your code enforcement officers want to help make this right. And some of these things might actually help them help the other residents or the visitors in the area. Yes, we hope that several of the ordinances that will be uh, presented to council in the next few weeks um, will allow the code enforcement division um, the opportunity to actually help solve some of these issues. Yeah, and, and they do. They work really hard. I know um, Joey Forgione especially is in that uh, in the parking check mode during the summertime and he is he is very proactive but again there are some things that need to be in place and staff's looking at that, council's looking at that to, to try to solve those issues so that we can progress if you will. Before we leave that topic, Steve, is there anything else we need to mention on that? Anything anybody needs to know about that before we move on? No, I, I think, you know, the underlying message is just be courteous and, and consider your neighbors and, and uh, you know, try to uh, keep from tearing up their lawns. <laughs> good, very good point. Um, the last topic we're going to talk about today is, is an issue that's really cropped up over the last few years to be more of an issue, and that is waterways regulations and that that seems kind of like a big task because we're surrounded by water most of which is not in the city of Destin that we don't have an opportunity to control or regulate but there are some areas and Steve you you have done a phenomenal job and recently presented to council some options where we can actually make some headway or potentially make some headway in in controlling our own environment a little bit and I'll I'll let you explain a little bit about the the issue that drove this as well as kind of where you're going with it um, you know, we basically the city's the city limits include the Destin Harbor, Marler Bayou, uh, Joe's Bayou, uh, basically most of the water bodies that are contained within the land, uh, the land perimeter. But uh, you know, we don't unfortunately we, we the the Florida statutes don't give us the power to to regulate what goes on on those waters, even mm -hmm. even in our city limits. Um, so we started exploring and I was tasked to, to look into mooring fields in an effort to try to get a better grip on, on some of the things that were going on in the harbor and the, and the bayous. And, um, you know, in that process, uh, sort of, uh, it, it was brought to my attention that, that there was a possibility of maybe getting the harbor designated as a port. Um, that Doing that would give us a lot of uh, opportunities for, for funding for projects within the harbor. Uh, such as straightening the old Pass Lagoon Channel, and and even uh, provide the um, you know some of the money per perhaps to do mooring fields, which are very expensive, um, and you know if we just did a mooring field, that'd have to come strictly out of the city's coffers. But more importantly, it gives us an opportunity to uh, to take more control of derelict vessels and and uh, floating structures. For instance, one of the issues that um, has been popping up is is all those floating structures that sit 
out on Crab Island all mm -hmm. summer long are starting to be parked in the in the harbor and in the bayous and that sort of thing. And and for uh, for some folks, that's a that's a real eyesore. And so we've been getting a lot of complaints about that and a lot of requests to try to do something about it. And uh, so we started looking into that the opportunities. Uh, one of the other opportunities that we may have if the if we can't get designated as a port. Um, is to uh, create basically a, a port and waterways district, which, you know, the benefit to that is it basically could encumber all of our waterways and uh, it wouldn't just be a harbor effort to, you know, we could also extend that effort over to the, um, to the bayous and, and uh, control, for instance, uh, anchoring of floating structures and, and derelict vessels and that sort of thing over there as well. Um, it's it's going to be a, a, a tough effort but I think it could pay some serious dividends in, in that it gives us, again, funding opportunities, the opportunity to, uh, to basically master plan what goes on within the harbor and, and uh, uh, have a lot better control of, of what happens. And it seems like it's more of a, a long-term fix, probably not overnight. Like you said, it may be even difficult to get some of this done, but I think the option is, or the idea is that we have a problem in our waterways. It's been brought to our attention by uh, our public at public meetings, uh, brought up to council, and councils address this repeatedly. And and I think that I, as council's given you some direction, I think based on your presentation on a, on, a, on a route to take. Yeah, we're going to actually um, do do a reconnaissance study and probably go to Tallahassee and meet with the ports uh, council and and the FDOT um, and see if we can start to move some of these along. Um, a couple of years ago, the um, the Haas Center did a, a study of the economics of the harbor, uh, which basically boasts the largest charter fishing fleet in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some actual real commercial uh, fishing activities that supply some restaurants and markets with, uh, with fresh fish and, and have a tremendous recreational um, aspect too. So, uh, and and uh, one of the things we've, we've discovered is that it Pretty soon, it looks like we're going to have some snorkeling reefs near shore. Mm -hmm. Snorkeling reefs installed both east and west of the pass. I think that might uh, dramatically increase the opportunities for ecotourism and and bring even more uh, activity to the harbor. And that would, you know, in, in 2013, that was estimated at, you know nearly a billion dollars. It was a very significant economic impact, not just to the city, but to the region. So um, that's one of the things that we're looking at and saying, hey, we, we deserve to, to, uh, to have some protection and to, to be able to do something with our, to protect our harbor and waterways. And Karen, you're lucky that Steve didn't leave <laughs> the city. He's still the development manager and he's going to be able to help your department push these things through because you, you'll have to, have to manage a lot of this. Yes. And, We're and very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. We love Steve. Um, you know, just if there's anything else you'd like to add, we covered some really good information. I think this is important for our public to hear and understand parking waterways regulations as well as that CRS recertification where we're receiving some premium discounts on insurance. That's just a big deal. Anything else you want to add to that? Karen, I'll let you go first. Well, thank you, Doug. <laughs> um, honestly, I am just so happy to be here. I, uh, the staff has been tremendous. Uh, the people that I've met here in the city of Destin have also been just tremendous. And I just look forward to continuing to come to work every day um, and, and working with the, the staff and the people of Destin to make it a better place to, to live and work. Good. We're glad you're here. And Thank Steve? You. Well, I'm very happy Karen's here, and I hope she <laughs> forgives me for the job that I did as an interim. You opened with that, but again, we know that we're, we know you've done such a great job. Again, good information, good things coming down the pipe, and we just we thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you for watching today's show, Destin Portion. Stay tuned for the City of Fort Walton Beach, uh, Joe Soria next. <laughs>